This is More Than Before with Nathan Cook. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. I am super excited for our guest today. He is a father of two incredible boys. He is a servant leader who is serving in a huge capacity. He wrote a powerful book called Truth, The Lies We've Been Told. And he has sung for the king of Nui, which is in Africa, if you don't know the country of Nui. Uh, But I'm super excited to have him on because he's got some incredible news about what's going on in his world. He's got a community group that has launched, and you guys are going to be able to check that out. Jared Miller, welcome to the show. Super excited to have you on. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Excited as well to be with you. It's going to be great. Well, you know, we always have to set it up for really good just in case it goes down, you know, in fire. <laughs> <laughs> we got our fingers crossed. Oh, man. Yeah, got to got to do that. I love your story. You know, you uh, music has been a huge part of your life growing up. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how for you has music uh, evolved in your life and how has that shaped who you are today? So my family dynamic, as far as I can remember, um, my parents raised me in church in a faith-based community. And as you well know, music is such a huge part of church, right? Um, half the service is music and half the service is someone speaking to us. And so, uh, man, music was always a part of my life. My, my mom and dad sang in the choir and my mom was from Illinois. My dad was from Mississippi. And I'll never forget driving my parents, driving back from Mississippi uh, after like a family reunion. And uh, yeah. in the early 80s, five, six years old, we had these things called cassette tape players. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'll never forget riding in the back seat, listening to the Michael Jackson Thriller record, like of all things, <laughs> right? It's, it's so crazy. It sounds hilarious. But like for those who don't know my story, like growing up, my parents didn't really let me listen to secular music that much. At that age, but for whatever reason, I had the Michael Jackson record, which is incredible. I didn't really fully, like, comprehend it, but, like, I knew, like, man, like, there's something to this. Like, I love to sing, and I love music, and just from, like, just a kid, I just had a passion for music. And, man, when I was, golly, eight years old, I sang in front of 5,000 people at a conference with, like, two other singers. And so it just really captured me at a young age, and Mm. my parents put me just in environments to where I could use that gift and never stopped. That's crazy. So how has that lent to being able to connect with people? You know that I love that. It's such a passion for you that music, it kind of really encompasses your entire life and what you're doing, but it's such a great connection point because so many people listen to music today, but I don't think that we understand just how impactful music is. How has that been a connection point for you when, when you're trying to connect with someone about, you know, maybe some more deeper things than not just the topical, like, hey, have you listened to this? Have you listened to that? But more on a deeper base, how has that allowed you to connect with other people? I'm a strong believer that music is, is a universal language, right? So, you know, you go to a concert and you may go with someone, but like there's thousands of people and you probably don't know who they are. But yet you're looking at them and you're singing at the top of, of their lungs you're all singing the same songs because you know all the songs and every word of the song, even if you can't sing and you automatically have a connection with that person. And now you're like best friends and you'll probably never ever see him again. So music is like a powerful connector. Um, and so I use that example to relate my relationship with God to people. Like mm. when they don't fully understand the unseen or invisible or spirit or God, whatever they want to call it. Like for me, it's like, man, have you ever just heard a song and it completely shifted your mood or it completely altered your state of mind? Yeah, that's like, that's how God is like on steroids. I I knew from like a young age how it affected me, not just like in my Mm. ears, but like on the inside, it affected my emotions. It affected like my thought process. I just, I came alive whenever I would either play sing music or listen to it. You know, it's funny because public speaking is like one of the greatest, like number one fears of people. And then like death is number two. Well, if you're, if you're singing on stage, you're not speaking, but it's another form of communication. And it's the same thing, give or take. Doing that for like decades has definitely helped me with like my fear of being in front of people. And then you get to a point like my age, when you're like your early forties, you're like, Jared, just get over yourself. (laughs) And you just focus (laughs) on the people and and try to connect with them as best possible. So many people listen to music on a daily basis, and I don't think they understand the impact that music has on their life. 
like the the lyrics everything that we listen to is downloaded into our mind and you know i, I remember growing up um I had, a, I had a good friend. He purchased the brand new Linkin Park CD. You know, if you don't know what a CD was, CDs, they came after cassette tapes and before MP3s. So, you know, right in the middle there. And I remember him saying, man, I got this brand new Linkin Park CD. It's absolutely amazing. And, you know, me being the good Christian boy, I, I, I snuck into his car and I stole the CD just so, you know, he wouldn't have that bad influence in his life. And, <laughs> And it's funny because uh, a couple of weeks later, I was thinking, I was like, what is it about this CD that like, like he's so, you know, enthralled with? And so I started listening to it. I was like, oh, man, this is, uh, you know, you start rocking out and like all of a sudden yeah. my demeanor and who I was started to change just because of the music that I was listening to. And I think a lot of people don't understand the effect that music, that media, everything that we're consuming on a daily basis that what that effect um, is that it has on us in your life. What has music done for you in terms of how, how has music brought out your identity in terms of the things that you listen to? Maybe those are things that were good in the moment, but later you're like, well, maybe that wasn't something that I should have listened to. What were some of the things that music actually pulled out of you throughout your life and allowed you to go, yes, this is really good. This is, I love this piece about my identity within music or maybe this is something I should kind of work on because this is, this music's bringing something out in me that it's not what I'm supposed to be. So music is not just audible, but it's spiritual. What you said is so true. People by and large don't realize the impact that it has on us as human beings. So music goes past the ears. It goes past the emotions. It goes right to the spirit. Like it, music touches us at our core. So it has a huge impact. So for me growing up as a, as a, as a Christian in church, you know, long story short, the Lord got a hold of my heart at a very young age. So like drugs and all those like certain checkpoint sins were never really had a major effect on me, but music did. Hmm. So I, I, I'm not being legalistic. This is just for me personally. There was certain secular music that I was listening to change my attitude, change my perspective, change my mood, change how I behave and how I responded. And I would get angry quicker. My temper would be different. It changed kind of, in a sense, some of my personality. And I remember hmm. uh, this is like back in the day whenever, um, for those who can relate, we had church Sunday morning and Sunday night. This is just my story, right? So I remember being like, God, I want to I wanna kind of draw a line in the sand and just take a break from secular music for just a little bit. And I, I never could. Like, it just, I just loved it. I loved the music. I loved that. I loved the songs. And I remember, it sounds so funny, 16 years old, like crying and breaking my CDs that, that I wanted to take a break from because it had an effect on me. And when I physically broke the CDs, it's almost like something broke spiritually. And it's, it's interesting how, how directly correlated our physical world and our spiritual world are related. It's like it's all connected. And so um, I'm not saying that secular music's bad. I'm saying like for me, there was like certain <laughs> artists that I listened to that said, hey, if I don't want to respond this way, if I don't want to feel a certain way, if I don't want to change – my attitude negatively. I need to get take a break from this because it's affecting me. And uh, once I yeah. did that, so many things changed in my life. I love that physical representation because I think sometimes we we think about the things that are are attached to who we are, and we never actually physically break those pieces off. There's we, we try to mentally break it off, like oh, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. It, it's we live in a very different world now where people are listening to MP3s. They can stream their music. You know what does that look like to stop listening to music? It's not like most people today can go in their back room and they're like, oh, I'm going to break these CDs or you know records or you know whatever it is. Sure. But it's true. Like it has such a meaningful impact in your life when you can do something physical to break that not even just emotional, but spiritual bond that we have with some of the things that are attached to us. For you growing up, what were what were some of the things that, um, you know, not necessarily that you had some crazy childhood, you know, laced with drugs and, you know, crazy, crazy things like that. But what were some of those things that maybe were a false identity that uh, attached to you as you were growing up that, man, it wasn't until you were an adult that you started to realize, man, like this, this isn't really who I am and I need, I need to leave that behind in the past. That's a great question. I think for me, so much of my teenage years, 
young adult years was laced with, and I didn't even fully realize it, Nathan, until maybe a couple of years ago, is that um, I was I was laced with this internal feeling that I I constantly had to prove my worth, and mm. that I was I was identified by what I did versus who I was. Mm. And for those who don't know my story, so I'm 43 now. My dad passed away when I was 20. And so even though all of us have a different story of things in their life that have happened when it comes to loss, for me, I had to make a decision as an early adult as, okay, this is how I've been raised. This is what I've experienced. But what direction is my life going to go for Jared? Not just what Mm. I've been taught, not just what I've been raised, but like, what decision, like, where am I drawing the line in the sand? Where am I, what direction am I going to go for my yeah. life? And that was such a huge, huge turning point. And it's amazing, Nathan, because once I realized, Jared, it's okay. You don't have to prove anything. Yes, you should strive for excellence. Yes, you know, you should be ambitious. Yes, you should try to be the best you can be. But instead of living your life for acceptance, what if you lived your life from acceptance and that changed everything for me and it's still a work in progress. I mean, it's so powerful. And I love that you say, you know, it's still a work in progress because so many people think that, oh, you know, there's going to be a checkpoint in my life where all of a sudden I'm never going to have to deal with this piece again. Like I, it's just, here's my new identity and here's where I move forward. And there's always going to be checks and balances. There's always going to be pieces in your life that come up and say, hey, is this really who you want to be? You know, those that's really what the difficulties in life are. It's it's a questioning of our integrity of is this who you really want to be? It's not that you've necessarily done something bad, but it's maybe it's a question where God says, hey, Jared, you said that this was not who you are anymore. Well, let's put that to the test. Let's let's see if you trust me more than you trust your your past. And that's a huge piece because most of us live from the past. We don't live from the future of who God has called us to be. And I think that's a huge piece. A lot of people are focused on this identity of, who, you know, this is who I was when I grew up. This is who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And now I have to figure out the rest of life from this condition where you and I both know that it's not about the condition that you're in right now. It's about the condition of your heart and who God has made your heart to be originally. So if you can define that, if you can say, hey, this is who Jared is, this is who Nathan is, this is how he should be showing up in his life every single day, then you can start to move from that place and be pulled from where you are right now. And it will help you in making those decisions that you're making on a daily basis. Jared, one of the things I really love uh, about you, especially, you know, as of recently within the last couple of years, you've really gone through an identity shift being uh, a solo parent, taking care of your boys, something that, you know, you don't always think about when you get into a union with someone else. And sometimes things happen and you don't have control over them. And I'm curious for you as a dad of these two young boys, you know, Grayson and Owen, how do you cultivate their spirit of who they are, knowing from your past some of the things that you're like, man, that wasn't really who I was, and maybe that was an identity that was placed on me, and I want to I want to cultivate my kids' personality and who they are versus putting on this facade of this is who you're going to be. You're going to be the doctor. You're going to be the you know the musician. Like I don't know if either of your kids are huge into music. It's kind of like one of those things that like as a dad who's, you know, like you <laughs> love music and you want your kids to love music. And maybe one of your kids is like, yeah, I don't really care about music. I'd rather go play football or, you know, do something else. Sure. How do you cultivate that within your boys and allow them that space to grow, but also as a father, protecting them from themselves to know that, yeah, that's not really you. The world's trying to put that facade on you. How do you, how do you go about doing that with your boys? Never underestimate the voice of a father in a child's life, mm. ever. A mother's voice is huge, but a father's voice is paramount, especially for young boys. So I lost my dad when he was 40, eight years old. He was 48 and I'm, I was 20. Now I'm 43. (laughs) My boys are seven and 11. And so consistently, if there's anything I'm going to get right, 
every day, I love you and I'm proud of you. Every day. There's a scripture in Proverbs that says, the more the words, the less the meaning. But what the audience may not know is that I only get them two days a week. Mm. And so I'm going to, I'm going to not force that, but I'm going to speak that into them every day of their lives. I'm going to say it so often and so consistent that when I'm dead and gone, it's still ringing in their ears. I want my voice of influence to be the loudest and most powerful voice that they hear. It's like when the world is screaming at them, you're a loser. And why would you want to do that? You can't do that. You're not good at that. I love you. And I'm proud of you because if they can remember my words and I'm a human father, maybe just maybe they'll say, if my father's proud of me and he loves me, I wonder how much God loves me. And I wonder how Mm. much God is proud of me. There's a direct correlation between an earthly father and a heavenly father, a father that you can see, a father that you can't see. And so for them, I influence them by loving them and affirming them and letting them know how proud I am, not because of what they do, but because of who they are. And when it comes to music, I don't force it. Like, I'm a big proponent. Like, what you force is fear-based, and what you allow Mm. is faith-based. So, like, too many people, like, don't leave me. I'll do anything. Don't leave me. And, like, they force a relationship or, like, they force a promotion. or Whatever you force is based on fear, and whatever you just allow is based on faith. Mm. And so if I can, like, they they know – it's funny. My youngest is seven. He, he, well, last year he was in first grade. He drew some artwork at school. And he's like, my dad preaches in front of people. My dad sings in front of people. And he's drawing like stick figures. Like he knows that his dad does certain things, but he also knows that like, to answer your question, I think the biggest way I influence my sons is by, by being authentic with them. And what I mean by that is like, dad's not perfect. And if I get it wrong, I tell them, Hey guys, I'm sorry. I messed up or, mm. I'm sorry, I lost my temper with you. Now, here's why I lost my temper, but I want to tell you I'm going to do better, and I'm sorry. Nathan, just last week, my seven-year-old, he's now in, in – uh, yeah, he's now in second grade, and he drew a drawing about, like, who he is, his parents, and the, the picture of, of who he is. He misspelled some words, but the last statement that he said is, I am a Christian. And I'm like, "Wow, hang it up. I can I can go to heaven now. I'm, I'm good. Just – Hang it up. If, if, I, if I die, I'm happy because it's like, man, if I'm getting anything right, I'm hoping that they're they're seeing my life more than what I'm saying. And that they're like, man, I want to be like dad. I'm like, well, crap. That's like the best compliment someone could ever give you. Yeah. We're not going to get everything right, but we got to get the important things right. 100%. And you know what I love is, you know, when you talk about your boys and looking at them, it's not a matter of what they do, but it's a matter of who they are. You love who they are. I think a lot of people misunderstand, especially a lot of Christians, you know, when, when Christians say, well, you shouldn't do that because that's a sin, or you shouldn't do that because of it's a sin. It's not, it's not a dogmatic piece where we're like, oh, like, you know, we just hate people that sin. No, because we all sin, right? There's no one perfect on this, on this earth. Right. Um, and at the end of the day, to say, you know what, um, your actions don't have to define who you are, but you can allow who you are to define the actions that you take in your life. And a lot of people don't operate that way. They operate from a place of doing versus the place of being. And I think if we were right. to understand that being piece of who we were created to be, we would do things completely different. Uh, you know, the world wouldn't be quite so crazy and broken as it is. It would still be broken because there's, you know, we're all broken, right? We're not perfect. A word came to mind as, as you were talking, and I'm I'm curious, how do you define it and how do you live this out in your life? I think you've already talked about it a little bit specifically with your boys, but as a whole, how does the word grace influence what you do in your life? Because I would imagine that you have received a lot of grace You've also given a lot of grace, but how does that word impact you today? Yeah, I I feel that grace is sympathy and empathy combined. What what do I mean by what do I mean by that? So with my boys, I don't just um, understand what they're going through. I need to feel what they feel because quite possibly I've been where they are or where they're going. And then grace, grace says, I understand where you are and what you're going through. I feel where you are and what you're going through. 
And because of the love of God in my life, I'm going to give you the same love and grace that he's given me. So I'm going to mm-hmm. walk you through this. And grace is not an excuse. It's not a hall pass. It's a learning experience to say, hey, this could have been you, but this is this other person's going to be you because of grace. We're going to learn from what happened, and we're going to grow because of it. And so it's one thing for um, for me to get you. It's something entirely different for you to get that I get you. Mm-hmm. And that's what people want to feel. They don't just want someone to say, oh, I'll pray for you. Or, you know what, man, I'm sorry you're going through that. I, I understand. And someone's like, no, 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 no. I actually believe that, like, you're feeling what I'm feeling, and you're understanding where I'm at. Wait, someone gets me? When my boys understand and feel that I get them, I think that it brings them closer to God. It's like a direct representation of like, man, so this is what the Bible talks about when it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this is what it talks about, that Jesus was tempted in every single way that a person could be tempted, yet he did not sin. So it is possible, man, dad, I thought I had to be perfect, but you're giving me permission to not live in my mistakes because I'm not defined by what I do. I'm defined by who I am. And dad, you're helping me Mm -hmm. understand who I am by showing me grace and showing me love. Man, that is so good. I hope you guys are uh, taking really good notes because uh, so much of what's already been said is just so good. It's filling because at the end of the day, we live in a world that constantly tells us it's about what you do. It's about what you achieve. It's what you make on a paycheck. And so many of us are so bankrupt spiritually. We're so bankrupt emotionally Mm. because we have no depth. I remember, uh, so I I had an opportunity when I was uh, probably a junior in college, I think I was a junior, where I got to go to Africa for uh, uh, three weeks, not a long time, but I got to go there. And one of the things that I found was I got to interact with the people that were there. And when you're in a country like that, the people just want to know you. They don't care about anything else. They just want to know who you are. Where'd you grow up? What did you do back home? Um, What's your family like? How many siblings do you have? Like they get deep into conversation with you. And when I say they, I mean the person you're walking past on the street stops you because they see you and they go, you're not from around here, obviously. And they're saying, hey, I want to know more about you. And there's this deep, deep level that they want to know and understand you. And I'll tell you this, when I came back home, it was probably a few days after I came home that I went through a massive depression for like two weeks because Mm. I didn't feel that same level of connection on an emotional level, on a spiritual level with people because we were just all passing by each other. We were never connecting with each other. You had this really cool opportunity to sing in Africa. I'd love to hear how did that come about and what was the experience like? But how did that experience also play into who God created you to be? Maybe maybe you knew at that time, maybe you didn't. How did your identity start to shine from that? Because I would imagine after doing that, you would walk away from that going, this is exactly what I was created to do. Like I there's no doubt in my no doubt in my mind because not everyone gets the opportunity to do something like this. So as a kid, 7 8 years old at my church, there was an, uh, an, an older woman who looked at me and she said, Jared, when you grow up, you're going to be a singer and you're going to be a preacher. Okay, people say things all the time. Sometimes yeah. it goes in one ear and out the other. Sometimes it really affects us and we grab a hold of it and it sticks with us. Well, for me, that was the case. Now, at that age, I was not thinking, nor did I have any clue that when I was older, I would be doing what I'm doing. But it did stick with me. Uh, I didn't... I didn't fully realize the capacity that I would be walking in. So fast forward to my adult years, 2018 to 2017, I'm leading worship for a church on Friday nights. It was a, uh, it was an extra service for a a different church than where I attended on Sundays. And so the pastor is from Nigeria and he said, Jared, we're going to take a group of people to Nigeria in September of 2018. And he paid for the trip. I said, let me think about it. Yes, I'll go. So, (laughs) I went. And and so I'm thinking, we're being told, man, we're going to go to some orphanages. We're going to go to some schools. We're going to go to some churches. We're going to, we're going to pass out supplies and food and, and, and goods to these people and really serve them. 
We're going to sing and minister at these churches. I had no clue, like before God, I had no clue. We would sing and stand before the king of Newi. Newi is a country within Nigeria. And our point person, the pastor of this local gathering, it was from Newi. Long story short, he grew up poor, and God really massively transformed his life in so many ways. Mm. And when he was in Newi before this trip, there was literal documented miracles that were taking place. The king heard about it and said, when you come back, please come see me and pray for me. Fast forward to the trip that we were at. We wake up and we said, we're going to see the king of Newi. Oh, cool. I thought this will be fun. We sit down in these chairs. Mind you, Nathan, this king is 93 years old. He is the oldest living king alive. He was older than Queen Elizabeth before she passed away. When the king walks in, everyone stands. I'm like, this is really neat. This is really cool. Our liaison speaks to him, comes to me and says, the king would like to hear you sing a song in our native language. Okay, Nathan, before we flew to, <laughs> to Nigeria, I had prepared one chorus in the Igbo language. And the song is called Imela. So I was prepared for that because we were going to sing a chorus in their native language. But I didn't know I was going to sing it right then and there. <laughs> and so in front of our everyone. Li- <laughs> right. And our liaison, he says, the king wants to hear you sing Imela. I said, when? He goes, in two minutes. <laughs> Me? <laughs> okay. No music. No nothing. Raw acapella. So two things could have happened. I could have been like, oh, and I could have been fearful and shriveled up and freaked out and be like, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. Or I could, this is what I was made for. This is what I was born to do. Like, without sounding crass, my parents got together and had a good time. And here comes Jared. Why? So I could sing before kings and priests and minister to the world with my gift. To insecure people, that sounds a little pompous. But for people who know who they are, it sounds very fulfilling and very rewarding and very humbling. And we sang the song. And so the the keyboard player who was along for the trip, I looked at him, I said, come sing with me. It was so like just in the moment. And he harmonized with me. And Nathan, a 93-year-old African king, tears coming down his eyes and we felt the palatable presence of God in the room by singing one chorus two times and it was the most unforgettable experience and I'll never forget the verse in the Bible that says find me a man who's skilled at what he does he will not stand before obscure men he will stand before kings and I Mm. got it I got it. I sing for the king every day, but now I was singing for a human king for the first time in my life, and everything changed. My gosh, that's so incredible! Like the, it's it's always funny to me how everything is so perfectly laid out in our lives, despite you know all the stupid things that we do and the mistakes that we make. And we're like, <laughs> really? Like how how could the, how could this all be a part of a plan when I mess up so often? Right. And I I love what you say. I was made for this to minister to the world with my gifts. And I think so many, so many people today would say, well, you know, I'm never going to have an experience like Jared to minister before an earthly king, right? Uh, A a king from, uh, uh, from Newi. But, you know, here's the thing is you don't have to be in front of a king in order to make a difference in a life of someone that could be important, that someone... Uh, if you touch their life, you could you could literally be the hands and feet um, of God. You know, you're called to speak something or to say something to someone, or you have some insignificant gift that you think it's in- insignificant, but in reality, it's something that is mind blowing that people look at and go, "That is so fascinating. That's so amazing." So many people truly do not value the gifts that they were given. They're jealous of everyone else's gift. Well, I don't have this and I don't have that. You know, I'm not a great singer. My my wife and I. Uh, so I I I'm a musician. 
Uh, I would say I'm not a great musician, but I'm one that can get by. <laughs> I can sing somewhat. <laughs> My wife, I love her to death, but she can't carry a tone. And I've tried. Like, I sit next to her, and I'm like, I'm like singing in her ear, and I'm like... Yeah, I'm doing everything. Like I don't know how to. I don't know how to make this better, babe. I love you, but like I. I don't. I don't know what to do. It's funny because she looks at me, and at a certain point in our relationship, she would look at me, and she was always frustrated because she couldn't sing, and she was frustrated because she wanted to be able to sing with me. That was something that she wanted us to be able to do together, and. For me, it was more like, okay, well, that's just the way that it is. God doesn't necessarily put two people together for their talents and their gifts. She still sometimes looks at me and goes, man, I wish I could just sing with you and be a good singer like you. And I'm looking at her going, you're gifted in so many other areas. Like, why would you want to be gifted in singing? Like, you you have these gifts and you have these gifts and these are amazing. So many people discount their gifts. Jared, you get to interact with a lot of people, especially being a pastor. You get to you get to speak life over people's gifts. What do you say to the person that looks at their gifts and they go, "No, I think God messed up. I, I was supposed to have that gift over there because this gift is it's not serving me." There's a key in that, right? This gift isn't serving me. What do you say to that person who says, "I just don't have any good gifts. None of the gifts that I have are worth a lick." Nathan, you're you're hitting on something so relevant and so powerful, uh, you're spot on. As many people that I've worked with throughout the years, this has to be up there with the number one or number two challenges that I face in leadership. So many people have a gift, but they don't embrace that gift and they emphasize another desire that they are not naturally God given gifted at and they get disillusioned, disappointed, depressed and frustrated when that gift is not blooming or blossoming when really everyone has a place where they add the most value. John Maxwell's 17 laws of teamwork. It's called the law of the niche. And so number one, people have a lack of awareness of where they really do add the most value. But when they actually discover where they add the most value, it's like what you said. Oh, well, that's great, but I wish God would have given me this gift. And it's like, well, why would God expand you for more if you haven't even embraced and maximized the first gift that he gave you? Yeah. It's like, why would you, why would you trade your inheritance for a pot of soup? Why would you despise what he gave you? Maybe it's because you've either forgotten or have never fully understood that no two thumbprints are alike. Mm. And if God gave Nathan a gift and God gave Jared a gift, maybe he gave someone else a similar gift, but no one has my voice and no one has your voice. And no one has, ma'am or sir, your administrative gift, and no one has your people skills, sir or ma'am, or no, you fill in the blank. The only reason why I'm writing books and speaking and preaching and building online courses and building online communities is because I was grateful for the first music gift that I had. So many of us put the cart before the horse and we get ahead of ourselves. And it's like, we live in a society, Nathan, that expects the world to come to them, which is complete backwards of what the Bible teaches. The Bible shows us, hey, Jared, I've given you the land, go take it. Yeah, but I look like a grasshopper compared to these guys. So you have people who make excuses and you have those who just obey and make it happen. If you'll just discover your sweet spot and like your specific assignment and what you're really amazing at and develop it, everything else will unfold. And it's kind of like singing before the king. I didn't go look for that opportunity. It came to me. I wasn't, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to see. I had no clue. I wasn't looking for that. Like success is not like someone calling you for an opportunity. Success is a door that you walk through that opens because of the person you've become. We don't, we don't attract what we need. We attract who we are. And if you don't like who you are, and if you don't like where you're at, the good news is you can change it if you choose to. That's so good. I like stop 
push pause, rewind, go back through that, listen to that again. Like it's so good. And and everything that you said is so spot on. Be grateful for your gifts that you've been given. If you've got kids, you know, and, and I talk about kids all the time on this podcast because I think, well, one, I've got kids, but I think we can all relate with kids. We've all seen the kid in the supermarket that's so ungrateful. Uh, you know, I don't want this. I, You know, Mike, it's so funny because mm. I was just talking to somebody the other day and they were saying, Oh yeah, like we 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 have these little cooked pasta noodles and we stuff them full of broccoli so that our kids will eat it. And so, you know, we we gave it to them and we were super excited and then they spit it out. And I was I was like laughing cuz our kids, I have taught them to be so grateful for everything that they have in their life. And when they're not grateful, I take it away. And guess what? When you're not grateful for the gifts that God gave you, and you, you spit on those gifts, you're not going to get another gift. That's not, it's not an exchange program. You don't go, well, I wish that I had a singing voice. So, um, I'm just going to forget about this engineering brain that God gave me. And I'm just, you know, whatever with that, I'm just going to go towards a singing voice. It's not an exchange program. God doesn't go, oh, well, I'm sorry. I messed up. Uh, I forgot. I was supposed to give you a singing voice. So we're just going to make you a really good singer. It's not how it works. And, mm -hmm. and I would almost rephrase one of the things you said to saying success is showing up with your gift to bless others. I think so many times we are so selfish and so self-focused that we only use our gifts to benefit us versus yeah. showing up in moments where we could use our gifts to bless other people. 90% of the time when I have a, an opportunity to speak life into someone's, into their world, I'm not getting paid. You know, as a coach, I get to ask great questions. I get to uncover things. 90% of the time, it's with someone that's never going to pay me a dime. I'm never going to receive anything back. It's merely my gift to them that I get to give them because God gave it to me. And man, life would change so much more in our mindset, in our perception, if we were to walk in this world understanding that our gifts aren't for us. Our gifts are to serve the people around us. Yes. Oh, man, like this is, it's so, so good. Jared, you, you have three things that are really important to you. I, I want to make sure we kind of cover a couple of these things because there's, there's three things that really stand out when you're serving, when you're working with other people. One, you guys can already tell he's passionate. He's passionate about what he does. He comes alive when he's doing and when he's singing, when he's being able to speak into people's life. So he's got a passion. He's got vision. He's got this servanthood um, piece inside of him. You, you, can, you can grasp all of these things based off of what you've said so far. But I'm curious for you, in your life, have you always had passion? Have you always had this servanthood piece of, of serving others? Have you always had vision? Or was that something that you developed over time that you became better at? What was that? Was that the gift that was there that was uncovered and polished up? Or is that just the gift that was like, there it is, like it's been there all along, I've been using it, but I never even knew about it until someone said, hey, you're really good at this. Passion. I've been aware of that my entire life. I've always been a passion guy, always. That's, that's one thing that I'm known for. <laughs> servanthood has been a process. Um, servanthood has been a process of getting my eyes off myself and focusing on others. And that sounds so simple, but you and I both know we're just, man, people are just selfish in general. And so I'm passionate, but what am I passionate about? And is it is it serving me or is it serving others? This is the way I look at it. If you're passionate about serving yourself, that's where it ends. If you're passionate about serving others, you both win. If I focus on being the best that I can be for the purpose of serving and blessing others, it actually comes back to me multiplied. If it's just about me and my financial gain and my status and whatever, man, it stops there. There's no legacy. I almost lose everything else. It just ends there. But if I focus on others, it comes back to me. I heard a quote. It really resonated. It said that strength is not for status. It's for service. Mm. Ooh. Say that again. That is so good. Strength is not for status. It's for service. The strength that you get from the Lord to fulfill his calling on your life it's not for status. Oh, look at me and look at my titles and look at my accomplishments. And no, no, 
It's for the service of others. Uh, there's a scripture in, in Luke, I believe, where those who are familiar with the story, where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Most of us know he was praying so intensely that droplets of blood came from his pores. And the next scripture says, and the angel came and strengthened Jesus and he continued to pray. And what I find interesting is the angels didn't come strengthen Jesus because he prayed. They strengthened him so he could continue to pray. So when God gives us strength, it's not because, attaboy, good job serving my people. It's so that I continue to serve his people. Mm. There's always a purpose behind the strength. There's always a purpose behind the gift. And nine times out of ten, <laughs> ten times out of ten, it's not about us, <laughs> but it's about other people. And mm. if we would just understand our life mission is to be a river, not a reservoir, God will continue to give to us what he can trust will flow through us. And mm. that's what it's really all about. It's so good. Like this, there's, there's so much that Jared, you're saying, I know that everyone listening right now is grabbing so much, uh, you know, uh, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and Jared, you know, I want to ask you one more, one more question here in a second, but for those of you listening, I want to encourage you go go check out some of Jared's stuff. Like go to his website, go to his social media, follow him on Instagram. You can find him at Jared Miller official um, on Instagram. He's got some great stuff. You know, he's got a really great book. I don't always, you know, have the person's book in front of me. I do actually have truth in front of me. Absolutely fantastic book. A uh, great read. It's a, it's a short read, which is what I like because you know, my attention span is pretty short, <laughs> but I love it because uh, you you really do have such a passion and a love for truth and a love for people and a love to see people succeed in their strengths. But man, you got to hear what Jared's talking about. Don't don't use your strengths to strengthen yourself. Use those strengths to bless other people. And you will come to a point in your life, no matter what your gift is. We we've all been there. Anyone who is using our gifts. We've been there when we go, man, I don't think my gift, I don't think my strength is enough. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And all of a sudden, we are given a strength to continue serving yeah. in a way that we never would have thought before. And it's because we show up. There are moments where I don't feel like I have the right words to say even though God has given me words to speak into people's lives, there's times where I show up at a conference and I have everything planned. I'm like, this just doesn't feel right. I don't think this is what I'm supposed to be saying. Uh, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to look like a fool. I'm supposed to be in my gifts. And guess what? There's a, there is a superseding natural gift that God gives. And he says, don't worry about yeah. it, Nathan. I've given you gifts, but I'm going to, I'm going to cover this area because I want to show you how much more that I've put inside of you because I'm there. Right. So there, there is something huge about this. So make sure you go check Jared out. Absolutely amazing guy to follow and, and hear what he's going through. Like, there's also one other thing I want to talk about right now. He's got a, a group, a community group specifically for people who are in servant leadership. Uh, it's the servant leadership creative. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Jared, tell, tell people that are listening right now, how this can help them in terms of their ministry and their serving, no matter where you are, because here's the thing I know, people who are serving at a high capacity are being drained really fast and they are not surrounding themselves with people who are pouring into them. And you and I both know at a certain point, you're gonna be empty, you're gonna be dry, and you're gonna be broken because you don't have the support and the surrounding that you need. Tell us a little bit more about this community that, that you've built, Jared. There's, there's three things that I know. You can't pour into a cup that has a lid on it. You can't pour into a cup that has a hole on the bottom of it. And you can't pour into a cup that's already filled. People have mm. lids on their life. They have holes on the bottom of their life. And they're filled up with the wrong things. They're not satisfied. It's an illusion of contentment, and they're not happy. There's a lot of great communities out there. You know, you and I both know everyone needs a coach. Everyone needs a community. Yep. What we specify in it is for those who are on the stage, off the stage, and behind the scenes on all level of church ministry. 
So just like what you said, if you're a leader in any capacity at, at church, you're pouring your life into volunteers. But who's pouring their life into you? Mm-hmm. Everyone, everyone needs someone who they're pouring their life into, and everyone needs someone who's pouring into them. And it's exactly what you just said. Leaders are pouring into volunteers, and they're being drained. And it's not that leaders don't know how to, quote, unquote, feed themselves. That's missing the whole point. It's that Paul had a Barnabas, but he also had a Timothy. Everyone needs someone who they're pouring into, and they need not just the Holy Spirit, but they need another human who's pouring into them. Not just encouragement, not just inspiration, but accountability, relationship that if their life goes sideways, their life is not over. And mm-hmm. so we find we find this seesaw effect where it's just not balanced. We'll be really mm-hmm. heavy on one end but not heavy on the other. And Nathan, it's where I call the cross cycle. Mm-hmm. In the vortex of the cross, favor with God, favor with man. In the middle is where we find creativity. Why do I say that? It's the leader who serves and it's the servant who leads. It's Mm. right in the middle of me pouring my life into someone and someone pouring my life into me. It's a river that has a continuum and everyone wins. Everyone is fed. Everyone is flourishing because there's no big eyes and no little use, but everyone is drinking and pouring from the same fountain. There's no dry bones. Everyone comes alive. Everyone is flourishing. And Nathan, it's what you said. There is a huge deficit of leaders who are being poured into by another leader. And it's such a huge mm-hmm. need. And that's why I feel like the Lord had impressed upon me to start Servant Leader Creative. Everyone should be a servant leader and everyone's creative because you have breath in your lungs. Mm. Oh, my gosh. It's so good. Uh, you know, one of the things I love about what you said, especially when you say pouring in, you got to have someone pouring into you. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum of life, whether you're serving yeah. a multitude of people or whether you're serving one small little kid that's in your house, you have to have someone pour into you. And I love that you define it in the way of it's not always encouragement. It's not always edification. It's right. not always enablement. We're not just enabling you to keep on doing what you, sometimes, sometimes the pouring into you is someone coming and saying, hey, dude, hey, gal, I love you, but this has to change because the way that you're living your life right now, the things that you're doing, you're going to end up in a really, really painful place. And I love you too much to have you continue to go that way and to not say something to you. And that is huge because so many leaders in this world, people of position, they do not have someone that they even give permission to, to speak truth into their life. 100% unadulterated truth. Truth is such a big topic uh, with Jared. You you, you gotta go, you gotta grab the book. Jared, here's the question I want to ask you because I, and it's in this vein of truth as kids we're told truths in your book you you even talk about this you know we're told different things growing up i'm curious for you what was a truth that as a child you just kind of ate up and you believed it over and over and over until maybe a point in your life where you became older and you started to question things you started to go is that really a truth is that is that actually a biblical truth is that is that a god's law thing or is that a man thing that was made up I'm curious for you, what was that truth that was maybe placed on you as a child that as you got older, you realized it wasn't a truth and now you no longer believe that? What what would that truth be for you and how would you encourage other people to navigate this question of truth in their life for the beliefs that have been put on them? There's four stages of life. There's dependent, independent, interdependent, and then back to dependent. When we're dependent as children, we really don't have a choice but to trust our, our main influence, what they're speaking into our lives. So you asked me a question. Growing up in church, we were taught certain things were right and certain things were wrong. It wasn't until I searched the Bible for myself and had my own relationship with God that I could discover the truth for myself. And that's one thing in the book that I encourage every reader to do is this isn't a book that's beating you over the head with this is the truth and this is not the truth. No, it's a guidebook. It's a handbook to show you how to find truth 
for yourself. Because if you're living someone else's truth, that's actually a false identity. Hmm. Until you know truth for yourself, you'll never take ownership and fully embrace it. It'll always be someone else's idea, someone else's perspective, someone else's reality. You have to come to your own conclusion when it comes to truth. It's so good. It, and it and it really is impactful. Like you, so many people have these ideas in their head and they never challenge them. They never ask, is this something that's actually true? And we just kind of place it on them. And I love what you say about going and searching, going and searching. And you can't just go to, you know, Google to search for the answers because Google, as we even know recently, Google isn't always telling us the truth. You have to go to what is true. Make sure you go grab a copy of Truth, The Lies We've Been Told. Absolutely fantastic book. Jared, I really do want to thank you for jumping on here. And for those of you listening, I want to encourage you, make sure you like, subscribe to the podcast and share this episode with a friend. You know someone in your life who is not living the way that they're supposed to be living. Maybe they're living in a shadow of who God created them to be. Today, that needs to change. Maybe they're hoping that they're gonna get a different gift later on in life. And you know, it just doesn't work that way. Share this with that person because every single one of us, if we wanna make a bigger impact in the world, if we wanna change people's lives, first, we have to own our gifts, we have to go out, and we have to start serving others with those gifts. And only until then that we start serving others with gifts do we get other gifts added upon us? For those of you listening, I want to encourage you, just like I always do, to be more, see more, and experience more together. 